table will now stand and face the flag while we honor America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Councilmember Helfrich? Here. Councilmember Holmstrom? Here. Councilmember Lewis? Here. Councilmember Storm? Here. Councilmember Cranlett? Here. Councilmember Zirking? She's not here. Um, she's having some health issues this evening. She really wanted to be here, but uh, she wasn't able to make it. And Mayor Masters? Yes. Thank you, Captain. Okay. First of all, I just wanted to say welcome to everybody uh, for being here, citizens, um, visitors, distinguished member of the media and city staff. Um, we appreciate you all uh, for being here. You are an important part of our decision-making process. So we thank you uh, for being here. Um, I think people know, but I, I just wanted to point out that if you are here to address the council this evening, um, we do have a clipboard here for you to sign up. You can, you can write down um, the topic that you'd like to speak about. And if it's on our agenda, um, we'll call for your comments after our staff report. If it's not on our agenda, um, there'll be, there is a place on our agenda for, uh, for you also. So um, if anyone else would like to sign up, now would be a good time to do that. Okay. Okay, that takes us to the next item on our agenda, which is uh, additions or amendments to the agenda. Paul is the, as the custodian of the agenda, um, I'll give you first, uh, First dibs on changing, making additions if you'd like to. As the custodian, I have none, Your Honor. Okay. Um, anyone on the council that would like to see uh, additions or changes to the agenda, you can suggest those now. Jeff? I'd like to make an amendment to the agenda to ask for a report on the power outage that occurred over the weekend. Okay. I can do that. And we'll add that between uh, number two and number three. Um, so that's a report on the power outage. Any other uh, additions or amendments to the agenda? Okay, seeing none, I'll give a quick report. Um, <laughs> it was Saturday morning, I got a call um, from uh, one of our fire volunteers um, who had uh, been in contact with the uh, with Carl Tesh, who's the, the um, Hood River County um, Emergency Services Manager, and uh, <coughs> reported that we had an outage and that it would be out for a while. I had spoken with a couple of our uh, electrical line workers the day before, um, and they informed me that our main line um, coming from the direction of Hood River um, faced some, some catastrophic um, damage to the structures that hold up the lines on Thursday. And that's, some of us noticed that on Thursday we had um, about an hour, hour and a half worth of power outage um, that was back on right just in time for our, our public meeting down at the pavilion. Um, but what that, that hour and a half is how long it took for our, for our crews to switch from our main line to our backup line, which comes straight from, uh, straight from Bonneville. And so when that happened, um, we were left with, with one line. And then we had a, a storm come through, um, and it, it involved um, the freezing rain and a lot of ice. Um, trees fell down. One of the structures that holds up the line, that our backup line, actually caught on fire from what I'm told. So two different structures were damaged and, um, and that's what turned out the electricity uh, sometime in the morning on, on Saturday. Um, so we received the call um, and uh, uh, a couple of council members, Jeff Halfrich, Mark Storm, um, and I went to the fire station to start coordinating um, our, our response. Um, we were met there by about 10 different uh, volunteers who were, um, were there to help, uh, answering calls as well as, as, as helping the community. Um, I was also in contact with the Public Works 
um, uh, workers who were checking to make sure the water was the water systems were and, and water treatment were still available, as well as um, tracing up the electric light superintendent. So, um, and he was he was giving me regular updates on. You know what the estimated time would be that we could um, we could get that power back on. It looked like it would probably be about 24 hours. So as a result, we contacted um, Hood River County, and um, they had already set up some warming stations and agreed to provide transportation for any citizens that felt like they needed a warming station. Um, and um, and then we got um, we we also update we we printed up a flyer fire station and. Um, uh, and posted that at the post office as well as the grocery store. Um, and, and we gave regular updates um, uh, through the day on what the status was. Um, ultimately, we decided before nighttime we ought to get to people at their homes. And so um, our public works employees and their significant others uh, agreed to, to go door to door through the community and deliver those, those flyers to people at their homes so that, that they would know. Um, and because we were anticipating going through at least one night without power, and, and some people do rely on that on electricity for heat in their homes. Um, ultimately, um, the power did come back on about 6:30, and uh, almost immediately I got a call from Tracy, and he had he had verified that it was anticipated that that would be it would stay on. It wasn't just a, a blip. So um, as far as I know, we remain on our backup line. Um, there just hasn't been enough time to repair all the damage that was done uh, earlier this week uh, for our main line coming from the, the Hood River direction. So um, I'll bet I, I left something out. If anyone has any questions about that, um, I'd be happy to, um, to answer those. Yes? I heard. Um during that morning when it goes out, I have a battery backup and UPS system on some computer equipment I have, and I heard it going off at like 4 o'clock, and then again at like 5 o'clock before the actual around 6 o'clock outing mm -hmm. that stayed off. And I heard explosions. Did we lose transformers on that as well? Um, as far as I know, and I, I could be wrong, and, I, and we can get Tracy to verify this, but as far as I know, um, it didn't impact uh, any of the city's lines or equipment. It was it was. The, the outage was all on BPA lines, and it was their crews that responded and replaced those lines. So we're not looking at anything out of our budget or our reserves to make up for it. Um, Pepper, again, that was, time as far as I know, and to, to find out for sure, we'll verify with Tracy. Okay. Yeah. Lance, yes. I would just like to say thank you so much for letting the public know as quick and as fast as you could let them know. Um, we all found out at the Shell station when we saw some of the crew down there, and I just want to thank you so much for your participation as being the mayor to let us know. I saw you all out, um, you know, hanging up the signs on the uh, doors of um, the residents across the lot. Just want to thank you for that. Well, sure, and I can't really take any credit for that. I mean, I think that the. Certainly, Mark and Jeff had a lot of input in that, but our, our volunteers and our partners in Hood River are really the ones that came through for the community. So I think um, we, we really appreciate that. So, Jeff? You might add a couple of things. Go ahead. Part of what, uh, when the power uh, outage went, I uh, got a phone call from Lance, who I called the mayor. And one of the things that we, in public safety, that we implement is the NIMS National <coughs> Incident Management System, or ICS, also the Model Incident Command and Control. A lot of people look at that as that's just something the military does or something that uh, police and fire or emergency services. But it's incumbent upon the city to have a plan. And that plan, uh, when I talked with the mayor, was outlining what goes on. And each council member is supposed to go through the training and have that as part of the requirements through the, the uh, national system because of 9-11. So to fast forward, when we recognized this was going to be an event, defining whatever the event is, whether it's power outage, earthquake, mudslides, we could be... Um, cut off between uh, the I-84, like on I-84, I talked with the mayor and discussed what we needed to do and have a plan in place, have trigger points in place where if this goes beyond this time, this is where we need to get out the information to the city. Because if everybody's out of power, a lot of times if you have a landline, the phone system will still work. 
but unless you, if you have a cordless phone, your phone's not going to work. You have to have a hard plug-in phone for that to work. And so a lot of people forget about those type of things. And so uh, one of the things that came out of this in one of the debriefs is looking for a way to make sure or have a phone number that's solidly connected that people can call, whether it's calling the fire department with a pre-recorded message or to a, another in, a Cascade Locks information line. Because um, that was one of the things we found is how do we get the message out to the public so they know kind of what's going on. Because there's a lot of rumors and speculation that I heard. And one of the rumors I heard that, that was related to me was like, we heard the city was uh, getting hotel rooms in the hotel for people to stay at if you didn't have power. I'm like, wow, that's one of the rumors. I heard. didn't hear that. I did find out employees of Skamania Lodge, they had a power source there at Skamania Lodge. And their employees were offered, because Stevenson was out without power, offered them to stay there like that. And so there was a plan. We talked about it uh, ahead of time. But this just really shows how isolated we can be once we lose one of our creature comforts, being electricity, or we lose water, or the big, the big event, whatever that event is and how that's defined. And so um, just to let you know that there are those, there's thoughts behind that. Usually the fire department runs that, but having some knowledge with that, worked with fire volunteers that are very well versed in this and set up a plan and had information going out as fast as we could. We didn't have the printer at the fire station, couldn't work, couldn't copy off some uh, uh, copies very uh, well. So I'm like, eh, fire rig's got a generator on. So we ran the little longest extension cord from the parking lot to our uh, copy machine, got the copy sent out that way. And so that's how a lot of information. So it was a very coordinated effort with everybody that was there. And I know there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. Um, one of the things is, is do we have the opportunity to take the generator that sits at the old uh, fire station see if it can be retrofitted to come here to offer a warming station or a warming place for people to come and have power. So the essential services that we need to get information out to people to do that, that's a possibility, but it all revolves around money and budget. And so we have to look at what the bottom dollar is, but you know, public safety is a, is a primary concern of what the, the city offers its citizens and that information is out there. So I want to personally thank all the volunteers that showed up, all the, the city uh, light crew, the public works crew that came out and their spouses that came out to pass the flyers out and put everybody out, out there because it was, we, I was thinking long term, more than 24 hours, and this just emphasizes when you look at the standard with the, what the government says, have a 72 hour kit available in case people can't get to you, have you know, water that's good for three days, have food source, candles, all those things that you can go onto the FEMA website and look at, that's your opportunity to look at that because we experienced that. And there's another storm coming, I'm not saying it's going to cause any problems, but we never know when the, the big one or an event is going to happen. And, we need to prepare for that. So I want to thank everybody that was involved in making sure the city was running and stuff that I didn't recognize, but the power sources, the generators they had to get up and running for, the wastewater treatment facility to make sure when you flush the toilet it didn't back up on you. And also when you had water, the water was running, but they had to get the, the generators up and running. And also one of the other things that came to light that when the first power outage was out, the, um, the uh, FEMA grant for the, the new radio system tower the generator didn't kick on right. Well, it found out the carburetor wasn't set right. They were able to start it up. It was going. That was fine. Then the next event happened with the radio uh, tower. The generator kicked on. We were able to have communications, radio communications with Hood River and respond uh, accordingly as if the 911, 911 calls for service came in, I found out. So that was a, a good thing to have in the gener backup systems that we had, redundant systems. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to learn a lot on this. Um, and also, I want to thank. Uh, the, uh, the fire department, the volunteers, and uh, uh, city staff, and uh, also uh, Hood River County. I know there's a lot of people and a lot of names that uh, uh, we contact, and it's hard to list everything. But I think, uh, uh, you know, for what it was, I think it was a good um, to see where we're at and if we need, you know, I think uh, the fire department. I think they were <coughs> they were uh, without. Uh, uh, there's an auxiliary. I think that they're looking at. I think that uh, didn't go on or something. Their heating system, I think it was. So a lot of things from this, uh, you know, we can learn, you know, learn from, so. Yeah. Well, Mr. Mayor, if I could, <coughs> Hood River County got on the uh, phone this morning and has arranged for the state to pick up the cost of a consultant to come in and help the city update its management uh, plan. So I think the timing is really good. So that will cost the city nothing when our first meeting is on February 9th I had <coughs> one person ask me or, or told me that uh, they had heard not to use water when the power was off. 
but I talked a little bit with Sheldon, and the way he explained it, we do have a generator that goes up to, you know, take care of the water supply. But maybe the word should be to conserve water. It's not that you can't use it, or something. It's just another point to add to the plan, I think. Not just don't use hot water. Yeah. Well, I don't even know that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think it's just another aspect to include. But uh, his recommendation was to conserve water, not that you couldn't use it. Okay, uh, I also want to point out before we leave this, this item is that um, since we, they are predicting another ice storm for tomorrow, you know, who knows if the predictions come true or not, but we've been warned that uh, it, it, if the power does go out again, in the case of those kind of emergencies, if it's going to be a long-term outage, um, that we do, I mean, we're very fortunate as a community to have that fire station that has backup power. And that really will be, until we, until we change our plan, that will be the point of contact for the city where you can get information. Um, like these guys have said, we've learned a lot from that and we will, we can do a better job. We can do a better job getting the word out sooner. Um, you know, if we can have a recorded message on the fire department line, you know, that's, a, that's something several people have suggested already. It's something we can do um, without too much trouble to, um, uh, to get the word out, but I, I just wanted to say though, through through this storm that we've had so far, and the storms that appear to be lined up, ready to hit us again, uh, I couldn't be more pleased with our city staff and our volunteers for the way they've responded. Um, having having said that, I, I I think I've heard from a few people already. We recognize that there are improvements we can make in, in how to do a better job of communicating with our our citizens and um, and responding to their needs. Did want to mention that. Right now, fire station will be your point of contact, and I, if I remember right, the um, the number would be three seven four eight five one zero. That's what I was going to say. Eight five one zero. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then you know, hopefully we can. Well, I mean, that was on our notices that went out uh, every couple of hours on Saturday. Um, but as people get used to that, in case of emergency, you can. You can call and talk to someone. And, and again, we're fortunate to have our volunteers who are there. Um, you know, um, Officer uh, Zerping set up a staffing plan, and we, we had a plan to keep the, the station staffed for 48 hours if it had gone that long. So um, again, we're, we're fortunate to have those volunteers and, um, and that, that great facility in case of emergency. So, OK. Um, Without objection, then, we'll move on to our next agenda item, uh, which is the adoption of the consent agenda. Um, <clears throat> on our consent agenda tonight, we have approval of minutes of the January 9th, 2012 City Council meeting and the ratification of the bills in the amount of uh, $82,771.51. <coughs> And before we move to motion, I had on the uh, clipboard that Cody Stillman wanted to uh, address the council about the approval of bills. So, Cody, we've got a microphone there for you. Standards Board on requirements for financial uh, statements. And in this financial statements, what came into effect that, ha that had to be required by all state and local governments by June 15, 2011 was any financial statement had to have five new components specifically shown. They are non-spendable fund balance, restricted fund balance, committed fund balance, assigned fund balance, and unassigned fund balance. So I'm looking at the financial record that just came out, and I'm not seeing 
these requirements of law. I'm working with the Department of Revenue, and they're kind of following the lead of what Washington is doing now, so our own state is not in compliance with it. So I'm in a catch-22 here of who to go to. But I also see that uh, in the, uh, let me get the date right, in the December workshop, we've, we've got a head of a department authorizing the cable HBO be subsidized by the electrical company. I'm also seeing that they're authorizing the all employee time to be billed to the electrical light department. Now that's a violation of, of or less law concerning municipal light and electrical. Now light and electrical means only electrical motors and heating devices. It does not mean cable TV or internet. Those are low voltage signaling devices that the FCC has jurisdiction over. Now, these, these laws come down from the from the the feds to the states. Now the states they write the laws. The problem is who's enforcing the laws. Uh, big problem there. But I want to know how you guys are auditing this stuff in compliance with this law when we're not even in compliance with the law on that. And then you're all supposed to have internal controls for local governments. These are safeguards you got to put in. you got to put them in the legislation. I'm going through our legislation. There ain't none of that there. And this is only part of, I'm in a whole series of municipal management books. And we're, we're, we are so far out of compliance. And then we, I asked Paul, do we have a city treasurer or do we have a financial officer? And he said, in fact, we have a financial officer. So we have Ordinance 123 here that says, we have the office of the city treasurer. Then there are duties assigned and all that. And I've been asking for, for compliance with this for a long time because I've been trying to get us into compliance with GASB Rule 34. And, and until we get 34 done, we're not going to even be able to get close here. It's going to require a full audit of, our, of the legality of how we're doing business here. So I would suggest you guys find out the answer to these questions and what's going on here. Because uh, the way I see it, you know, there's financial liability if you don't do it right. I mean, the state of Washington right here from their own website, I'll tell you right here, it has to be done and complied with by all local governments. Is this one you want me to And I have other information if you want. Yeah, you can have it. I don't need it. I've got, I've got tons of books. I'm going to the school and online. Good. So that, that's not a problem. Um, so, you know, if you need more books, I've got them for you guys. You know, to show you what all this means, why this is so important, so that you have transparency and you're showing the people who are the actual stakeholders of this corporation here, what's going on here in our financial. You know, it's that simple. And I'm not putting blame on anybody because this has been passed for a long time and overlooked. But we need, we need to come up with some sort of a solution to deal with the problem. Because there's so many violations of the laws going on, and I think you know it. That's not funny, especially concerning our electrical life. They're going to come to a head real soon. That's all I got to say. If you got any questions, you can ask me. And I'll be glad to lend you these books. Great. Co Cody, do you know of any cities or counties or school districts that are currently have made those changes? Um, I'm working with the Department of Revenue on it. It just started after I finished the class. I'll, I'll come back with you on that. So um, they're having a real problem with it too with me. So you're not the only ones. Because they know that they got to comply with it too. They just don't know how to do it. But some of the some of their compliance is already there. Such as segregating of the funds, it, it, you'll find it in, in oh, the OER 150, so we'll tell you where to segregate funds. The funds have to be segregated. That's been brought up. We, 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 we both decide between arguments between us that, yes, that does cover a lot of it. Segregation is a lot of it. And in that segregation, you should be able to know whether you have a restricted fund or not, or an assigned fund or an unassigned fund. Mm -hmm. You know, so all of, our, all of our enterprise funds are restricted funds. Sewer is restricted for other uses until the bonds paid off. I'm learning all sorts of stuff through this municipal stuff. So, the FTC has rules. The feds have rules. They pass down to the states. Thing is, they write the laws, but nobody wants to enforce them. Nobody's got the budget. That's where they're at with me right now. We don't have the budget. 
they have the budget, they, they know that there's a crime plan. For example. So are we going to clean it up or are we just going to go on and being illegal too? So that's the that's bottom line. And you, like I said, if you want to borrow the books, I've got no problem. You know, it's in the best interest of the city. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Cody, did you have um, a paper with notes that you wanted as part of the record? or? No, the, okay. just, the books they talk for themselves. The books, okay. They're, they're the law. It's best days of the law. All states and local governments have to comply with it. So I don't have to go no farther than that. Just right. put out the statements. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go Ducks. Yeah, we did, but we're losing six killers so far. No, I got you. No, I'm not saying. He's got yeah. <laughs> I've been busy all day. Kill us. <laughs> Um, Mayor, if I could pick up on the okay. comment that Cody made. I, I think the timing is really good, um, Mary Ann. I can't remember when the auditor will be in to give his report to council. I have given him the tentative second meeting in February. Yeah, so the, the, that would be a good time for us to have that discussion, because if you can't drive some of these things out of your audit, um, then we ought to take a second look at whether or not we should be audited. But that's the place to begin driving those. The auditor should be able to tell you if you're in compliance and, and if not, what corrections need to be made. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Uh, so at this point, um, we await a motion for the consent agenda. I'll move we approve the consent agenda. Okay, a motion has been made by Randy Holmstrom. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second by Gail Lewis. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll, move, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the adoption of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstention? <coughs> Motion carries. Okay, next item on the agenda is public hearings and we do not have public hearings this evening. So we shall move to our action items. Uh, first action item tonight is, uh, before we move to our action items, I did notice, George, um, that you had signed up to speak, but you didn't, you didn't uh, identify a topic. Oh, I'm sorry. So I, if it's one of these action items, I don't want to lose you in the shuffle. It's not. Okay. It's not, I'm here to talk about the uh, boundary change. Okay. So the uh, first action item tonight is approval of Re resolution 1230, establishing the mayor's committees with responsibilities and structure to advise and recommend to the city council on issues of community-wide concern and repealing resolution 1222. Paul, well, was I correct in understanding that you had a report for us on that? Yes, Mayor, and because Kathy worked with you on this issue, she'll be giving the report. Okay, uh, mayor and council, um, resolution number 1222 was adopted in 2011 and it applied to the mayor's committees at that time. This new resolution number 1230 is more in line with what was discussed at your December meeting. And basically um, have just added the function, not added, left the function of committees as they were and took out um, names of committees and so this is in line with your um, council rules that states you have standing and temporary committees and would recommend approval of resolution number 1230. Okay, we've got a staff report and we did not have anyone sign up yeah, to... Yeah, I did like I'm three, three issues there. Okay. Committee, fire, contract, and... Okay, so you've identified three areas. Three areas, yes. yes. Okay. So, uh, citizen questions. Cody. Yes. Okay, I'm curious about why this is on the agenda. Right now, the city has the city services committee on hold, and we could be tackling issues. This government is ignoring Right now, charter provisions required by state law to be stated in our charter asset. Therefore, I doubt we have legal right to be in the utility companies to begin with. Uh, the 
city services could be covering those issues. Right now we're on we're on lawful expended funds in violation of state law. Yet the government wishes to ignore it with a committee on hold, which could be working on this problem. Right now the city has unlawfully gone beyond the annual time limit to annually set the electrical light rate by January first of each year, and that is the legal requirement that the city services committee was was built to do. And there are many more. All issues the city services committee could be addressing and was established by an elected government long before this appointed government. Any questions? Well, we won't do questions at this time, but we'll have a motion and a second and a council discussion. Question. Question. Okay. Did you have a question for us? No, I'm okay. questioning the whole process here. We've got plenty of other things to do than that's committees. <coughs> okay. Um, so, uh, having heard a staff report and having the citizen questions, um, the next step is for us to make a motion and a second. And that would be to the council. I make a motion to approve resolution 1230 establishing mayor's committees with responsibilities and structures to advise and recommend to the City Council on issues of uh, community-wide concern and repeal of Resolution 1222. Okay, motion has been made by Jeff Helfrich. Is there a second? Second by Mark Storm. Okay. Council discussion? Questions? Comments? Okay. Uh, Seeing none, I'll make a comment um, just in response to uh, what I'm, I'm going to interpret as a question uh, from Cody, and that is that at our December uh, 19th work session, we discussed the idea of um, realigning our committees to match our council goals. And this resolution is merely um, in, in uh, conjunction with that, with that idea that um, we, we've established council priorities and goals and <clears throat> areas that we want to work on, and um, this is one of the first steps in aligning our committees with those priorities so that we can get all of our resources behind them. And for that reason, I support the motion. Well, Lance, can I address that as well? Uh, not right now, no. But I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. Well, it needs to be addressed on the record right now. I mean, you, you talked about all the children's city services committee as well now. That's right. So, yeah. Why? Because you don't like me. Uh, the I appropriate time to ask questions is yeah, during the citizen question time. Thing. Now we've had a motion and a second. Council will have a discussion, well, you and we'll take that. action. Okay, go ahead. Do yeah. what you want to do. You'll do it anyway. <coughs> is there any more questions, comments, or discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstention, the motion carries. <clears throat> we'll now proceed to our next agenda item, which is to approve the contract for interim fire chief services from the city of Hood River. Paul, I understood you have a staff report on that? That's correct, Your Honor. Honorable Mayor, members of City Council, you have before you the proposed contract between the City of Cascade Locks and the City of Hood River for interim fire chief services involving uh, Chief Wells from Hood River. This is something that uh, was discussed uh, and recommended to you on your January 4th meeting. Uh, since that time, uh, both, both attorneys staff has developed a proposed contract uh, recommending that this contract be approved and that the mayor be uh, authorized to sign. I also included for your information uh, Exhibit A, which is the position description for an interim fire chief, uh, as well as the preliminary draft of the revised uh, fire department budget. So at least you'd be aware that we are moving in that direction and we'll be meeting with Chief Wells tomorrow morning sometime to finalize the budget and bring it back to council. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you, Paul. 
Uh, Bodhi also um, had some questions about this agenda. Yeah, this is a short one. I'd like to know what you're doing when you got Order 361. Where the if you sit down, it'll be easier for the microphone to catch your voice. Yeah, I'd like to know what you're doing when you got Order Number 361 still on our record, where we gave all the powers to be a, a fire department and an ambulance department to the river. It seems to me that the process is to repeal this ordinance first, because anything you do by the writing of this is repealed the minute you do it anyway, because this is still on the record. It's kind of like putting the cart before the horse, you know? Okay, thank you, Cody. Okay, uh, having heard the questions, uh, oh, Paul, did you want to respond to that? If it's a question or not? Uh, in, in about doing, the ordinance? Yeah, in, in doing the legal review, usually these those things don't come to play. You're still providing uh, fire and ambulance services. This is the technique for how you happen to be doing it for the interim basis. Okay. Okay. Um, so having the staff report, so there's some questions. Uh, the next step is a motion and a second from the council. Mark? Make a motion <clears throat> that the city council by motion approve the contract for interim fire chief services with the city of Hood River and authorize the mayor to sign the contract. Second. <clears throat> okay, we have a motion by Mark Storm, second by Randy Holmstrom. Council comment, question, or discussion? You said both attorneys reviewed the whole process? Yes. Okay. Uh, and as I understand it, the City Council and Hood River is taking their action tonight on this same contract. Other council comment, question, or discussion? Well, I just wanted to mention I appreciate the, uh, you know, Cody bringing the the, uh, the ordinance to our attention. It is it is an out of date ordinance. We haven't been doing it that way for a while, and I think it is it, it is some, something we should look at. But I also agree with Paul that what we're really doing is taking care of business for the community and providing emergency <coughs> services. Uh, so I do hope that, that that will be addressed and brought back up. Mark, I think a lot of this will be addressed too on the uh, uh, safety task force committee too. I think a lot of this will be um, you know gone over and reviewed and. And a lot of things that are, are missing, um, you know, will, will happen at that time, I think, or go through. Yeah. So. And something that the, the Public Safety Task Force right. certainly could, could bring up and make a recommendation of. Okay. Tom, did you have any comments or questions? Any more comment? Okay. Seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Okay, we'll move now to the next action item. Approval of Resolution 1231, creating an intergovernmental agreement for the Oregon Municipal Utilities Association and authorizing the mayor to sign. Paul, well, do you have a report on that for us? Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, for a number of years, the, all of the cities that operated municipal electric utilities had an organization that was organized and tucked underneath the League of Oregon Cities. For a variety of reasons, the cost of providing services, lobbying interests, uh, providing technical assistance to uh, cities that provide municipal electric the, all of the cities got together and decided they need to create their own special association. So what this contract does is to bring all of the cities in Oregon who provide electricity into one newly chartered uh, association. Yet to be decided are the board members, the budget, uh, what the membership fee is. But this is the first step in moving electric utility municipalities into an organization of their own. We're recommending that you adopt this. Thank you, Paul. Um, please
is somebody, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't have anyone signed up to ask for, uh, questions about that. And so the next step is for the council to make a motion and a second. Mark? Uh, recognition that the city council by motion adopt resolution 1231 authorizing the creation of the Oregon Municipal Electric Utilities Association and authorizing the mayor to sign the intergovernmental agreement, IGA. Okay, motion's been made by Mark. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second by Jeff. Council comment, question, or discussion? Gail? Uh, in, in the current organization, do we pay into anything? Mary Ann, do you know, does the city pay anything in the current Municipal Electric Association? I'm not aware of anything. But we probably will be paying something in the new organization? In the new organization, there, the new board would create a budget and probably would have a membership fee for you to pay. But we don't know what that is yet. No, because this is the right. first step. If everybody agrees to create the organization, there would be a board, the board would develop a budget, and that would come back to you for action in the future. Okay, and then depending on what the implications are, we can either stay a part of the group or withdraw. Exactly. But if we withdraw, then there's nothing, right? Because the organization and le at the League of Oregon Cities is also That is correct. That's my question. Okay. Financially, yeah. But it looks like if we don't like financially what they come up with, we can pull out of it. Yeah. But obviously there's going to be some financial, there's going to be some, some cost to it. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, OMEU dues, it seems to me we've had something that like is, that. Those don't all come to me, but that comes to the I sometimes don't see them. Oh. I would have to look at uh, the computer under the vendor if, to see. If this was under League of Oregon Cities, not all cities are part of that. So I think we'd be justified in asking for a reduction if, if in fact, those dues, if we haven't been paying for it already. Yeah, that, that certainly may be the case. Paul, isn't it true that the, we currently give these same services through our association with League of Oregon Cities? If the, if we're just we're not creating a new service. We're just creating a new way that we get the service. Right. You're creating a new organization that would have a singular focus, which would be the municipal electric corporations in the state, and that would be your lobbying group, your technical assistance group, because that service moves out of the League of Oregon Cities. So. Jeff. And just by reading the benefits and this action of the city, there's been several comments made by citizens present and other about electric utilities and house run. This is a resource that we could use to ensure that we are in compliance or if we find we're not in compliance, give us guidance towards that. That's correct. Okay. Because, because electric is such a highly regulated entity and because we live in a highly political system, the, the other members, cities who operate these services felt they would be better off <coughs> Yeah. Have the other cities already approved this? Or I where do we not at? know which ones have. They're okay. all, we're all going through the process at about the same time. Right. I've not found anyone yet, Gail, who's already adopted this. Right. Are there more questions, comment, or discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Uh, next action item is the approval of web hosting contract for tourism website. Paul, I understood you had a report for us on that? Right. Honorable <laughs> Mayor and members of the City Council, this is item number 5D. Uh, in May of 2011, the Tourism Committee recommended that the city enter into a contract with Sky, Blue Sky for
for the development and display of a website promoting the community of Cascade Locks and events for, for tourism purposes. As, as best we know, that contract has been completed and there's a website ready to go. And then Blue Sky was purchased by the new company, uh, Kinetic Media. Uh, and Kinetic Media comes to the city and now has a contract uh, for $20 a month to manage the tourism website. So what we're asking is for council to uh, authorize that contract and authorize the mayor to sign. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this is another one where we did not have anyone sign up to uh, speak on that. Although, uh, Kayla, you did walk in late. I don't know if you have. We had a three. Oh, okay. Did you did you want to speak on this? I just wanted to give you that chance. I wanted to see if anybody had any um, questions or anything on how it went. Um, the website is actually not completed. There are just a, like three more changes, like cosmetic things, lime through things like that. But for the most part, the website is completed. There is still some content that we have to put on there, but that's. will link with the city's website, which is an important issue. Okay. So we haven't heard the staff report and from our citizens. Um, the next step is for council to make a motion and a second on this item. I'll move for approval of the web hosting contract for the tourism website with Kinetic Media. Okay, the motion has been made by Randy Holmstrom. Is there a second? Second. Second by Gail Lewis. Uh, council question, comment, or discussion? Jeff. The funding source, is this coming out of tourism's budget? Yes. <coughs> it's already been paid for, but then it says the annual initial fee and then the $20 per month. Yes. So they're talking It's been prepaid already? Yes. Prior to the council approving the contract? No. The contract had already been approved. The development of the website had already been approved. That okay. Then the, but then all the funds come out of the tourism, tourism budget. budget. Okay, so because there's there's a change in ownership in the web hosting company. Yeah. Right. It's just a re okay. Mm -hmm. Mark, it, was it the same price also? Yes, nine hundred. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I just got one general. I mean, the the, the expense is kind of nominal. That's good, but the way the contract's written, everything elaborates on what the customer is responsible for. That's and. Um, Yeah, it just doesn't elaborate on what their scope of, what they're providing through web hosting. You know, it's, it's, is it going to be on their servers or our servers? We use theirs. So, I mean, it doesn't account for any availability or... And I could get you the original information from the original... Was that in the original agreement? Am I yes. missing something or... Yes. Okay, I, I just see this is kind of one-sided and... If the other is accounted for, I'm not concerned. It's just I don't see it here. The original cost for the website was $900. That's already been expended right. and built. This, this provides the ongoing maintenance and provision of the website. That's the $20 a month. All right. That's what you're dealing with here. Okay. So, the, Kayla, the way the, the, the staff report came to us is that the, the original, it sounded more like the original contract was for um, the, was with Blue Sky for the creation of a website. And, and I didn't see anywhere where the original contract included a monthly fee. So it sounded from reading the staff, the staff report, it sounded like um, Kinetic bought out the company. The work had already been done by Blue Sky. Then Kinetic comes in and says, well, yeah, that, that's a good website, but then we're going to need $20 a month to, to host that website that our, the company we just bought built. Is that correct or is that is that wrong? Um, to be perfectly honest, and I was 
I'm not feeling like that's necessary at this point. But I did. I just did want to comment that um, one of our, one of our, as I, as I mentioned earlier, in a, a different agenda item, one of the things we're trying to do is align our resources as a city behind certain specific priorities. And um, it, it feels to me like if the city's paying for the city website that we should be using that rather than just linking to another website, we should have a tourism page or several pages within our own website. Now I know that's that's something new, right? That wasn't around in in May when we approved the contract originally. There is a tourism website now. And that's usually how um, the, did you say there is? There is. There is, yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of what we wanted to do, which is kind of revamp it and make it, you know, so. But I see what you mean by connecting to making it Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think, though, that, that and you may not, the tourism committee may, may not be aware of this, but I, a, a couple of years ago, the city invested in a new website. Uh, and, um, and I think it does have the capabilities. As we were looking through the different um, proposals for for web hosting for our city site, um, one of the things we specifically looked for was the ability to do things like showing short videos and and having more photos and things like that. And so it actually doesn't. I, we I think that. Right now, we have a limited package, but we can upgrade. And that was, that was one of the biggest reasons why we didn't do that, just the limitation of that. Like, because those photos are pretty big, you know, for each one. Yeah. But I, I do think that this is a company that's, that, that has a capability, as Kathy's saying, you, you can upgrade. And I think it makes a lot of sense for us to, again, along with aligning our resources behind the, you know, some common goals, for us to maybe look at that upgrade as opposed to bringing in a new company to set up a different website that may or not may or may not um, mesh well with our with our existing site. So I, I mean, I'm not, I'm certainly going to um, support this motion, um, but I think as as we start, you know, as we get a chance to meet the tourism committee and the council, and and have some discussions about these types of things, um, I think long term we may want to look at is hey, what's the possibility of upgrading our our city website so it can host more and, and can be more of a, a one stop for you know, our citizens, our visitors, and everyone. Um, so, the, and, uh, you know, and, and what that does is allows us to get all of our resources pointed in one direction as opposed to multiple different directions. So, I just wanted to make that comment. I hope that's the that's direction we'll, we'll look. Jeff? Gail talked about something that it kind of raised my eyebrow a little bit when I was reading this in that caught it, but it, it does talk about what the customer is going to provide, but it doesn't say what our employer or contracted person or co the company is going to provide, what they are going to do for us, what specifically lined out, if this doesn't happen, this will happen. Mm -hmm. And the more I read through this and not seeing that other contract, I don't know if I can support that right now until just reviewing that other contract. Is, and it's in the language that it says, yes, we will agree to the prior contract and then uh, with these amendments that with the consumer or customer, the tourism committee would be for that. And it 
so it melds together. So yes, we'll, we'll still go with the prior obligations that we agreed to with the former company, Blue Sky did, and then Kinetic Energy says, or Kinetic Media says, yes, we'll, we'll do all that. And I feel more comfortable now after Dale kind of said that and reading through this that way if we saw that come forward and hold that over to our next council. Yeah, yeah and I, you know, I think, and I'm not into the details and all this, but I think the big points of debate on this would or should have occurred when the $900 was going to be spent. You know, now that we're down to, what, $20 a month? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and it's cancel, we can cancel it at any time with 30 days notice. I just, you know, I, I agree with you looking at the long term, but I don't know if that should withhold allowing tourism to proceed on their independent path, you know. But I mean, I've, I've been out of the business for a while, but <coughs> it, uh, it used to be one of the key things in web hosting of where you went was what connections they had for keyword searches. And so that's another aspect of whoever's hosting your website, what kind of infrastructure they have. So when people are looking for windsurfing, we pop up along with Hood River or something, and the, the, the search capabilities are an important aspect of that. But for $20 a month, you know, I, I don't have a problem supporting it in, in the short term. Well, Mayor, I think this is, was really the position of the Tourism Committee. The, the big dollars have already been spent. You're on the verge of having that website. This is $20 a month to get it activated, and they're looking at uh, sitting with council and, and crafting a, a, a more aggressive tourism program. That this, this is really how this move forward. Let's get it done. <coughs> Other questions or comments? Council discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, uh, next agenda item for us tonight is the adoption of the process for recruitment selection and hiring of a permanent city administrator. Paul, I understood you have a report for us. I, I just might. So, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, this is the uh, issue that you discussed at your January 9th meeting. I've made some adjustments as you directed in the proposed steps which are attached to the staff report. And I also included in the packet the critical factors worksheet that you requested and I sent out to you in advance of this session. Uh, so the recommendation here is that you by motion adopt the proposed steps in the process to recruit, select, and hire a permanent city administrator. And I'd like to spend some time with you tonight uh, going through uh, the critical factors worksheet. And I've got the newsprints set up on the wall there so we can get your ideas, so we can get that finalized and then move forward. Okay, thank you, Paul. We also did not have anyone sign up to uh, ask questions on this agenda item, so we'll move to council motion and second. Mark? The recommendation that the city council by motion, adopt the proposed steps in the process to recruit, select, and hire a permanent city administrator. Okay, motion's been made by Mark Storm. Is there a second? Second. Second by Randy <coughs> Holmstrom. Council comment, question, or discussion? Uh, yeah. Are we going to go through filling this out tonight? Yes. I think that is that comes later under reports on our agenda. Okay. And Brainstorm critical factors for permanent city administration. And the form you sent out, does everybody have that as a point of discussion with their input? Not the form. Uh, the form is, al is also part of the, um, the, the staff report. 
So if we have well, a I know, but we got the form. I just wonder if anybody has filled it out with their ideas and suggestions for these categories. Or are we starting with blank? Well, I I read it. I didn't didn't write a name, but I did make some digital notes on right. the smart form. All right. So I didn't fill it out. No. All right. Anyone else? Mine's blank. I'm kind of filling it out now. Okay. <laughs> I haven't even had it yet. I know. <laughs> I didn't get my packet in the mail, so this is the first time I reviewed it when I came in early. So okay. I guess my idea is that I was jotting down in my head. Okay. So uh, it also came out on email. Yep. Um, and, and Eva uh, actually called in when she said she couldn't make it tonight and shared some of her ideas with me, and I agreed to carry those forward as, as part of my. That answers your question? Okay. Other questions, comments, or discussion? I'll say that it's a, it's a good timeline. Um, it's a, it, it, it creates a process that uh, is open to the community, that's going to be transparent, um, and uh, gets us to a deadline for applications in May, which gives us some time to um, conduct several stages of interviews. I do hope that the process is going to involve many different um, perspectives from within our community, not just council action, as we've discussed it the last time we came up as a report. So I think it's a good process, and I, um, I'm going to support the motion. Gail? Uh, I just had one. How does this vary, or do you know what the other process was to where they had to end up settling for you? <laughs> It was a disaster. <laughs> um, yes, I looked at it. The, these processes are fairly similar. Okay. So the whatever the difficulties were weren't. It was due to lack of candidates rather than a gap in the process or what? I mean, no, did, in, in this business, it's really I, hard I understand. to know whether whether you didn't you weren't paying enough, and whether the situations okay. weren't right. Okay. I mean, I'll just say, and Tom could probably jump in, having been part of that process as well, that this is a process that extends over at least five months and, and on into to eight months. Whereas before we were doing a process, it, the same, trying to put the same pieces into a shorter, much shorter time frame. Okay. Okay. And so that, I, to me, that's the critical difference. There's other, there's other minor details that are that are different. Okay. Um, that I think are good adjustments, but okay. I think that's the main difference is that you had it squeezed into a short time frame, and um, and this one is not does not appear to be. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? No. Oh. Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. Those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Mayor Council. Thank you. We'll revisit that shortly. Uh, we'll move now to our next action item for the evening to, uh, to approve the creation of City Council Subcommittee on Economic Development. Well, I understand you have a, a report for us. Honorable Mayor, members of City Council, uh, I understand that uh, Representative the Honorable Representative of Nestle will want to speak on this topic also. Yes. Um, we have discussed over the past couple of months the, the idea of the council creating a council subcommittee uh, on specific priority topical areas. Public safety is one, uh, economic development is another. So what this uh, staff report brings forward to you is a recommendation that you by motion approve the creation of City Council Subcommittee on Economic Development and to task them to work with the Port of Cascade Watch, the community, and others uh, on the Nestle opportunity, additional economic development opportunities, uh, and to make a, a, an aggressive statement for the community that this council and this community are interested in jobs and economic development over the long haul. I have submitted, along with the report, the Job description, um, and 
I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Dave, you wanted to talk to us? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Council Members and uh, Paul. Um, I uh, appreciate the Council bringing this um, to the community's attention. Um, we are still moving forward with, uh, with the process. The, uh, obviously, the, the most significant um, activity that is still pending is the water transfer between the city and ODFW's uh, Oxbow Hatchery. Um, that is still in the process. Uh, it's probably going to be in process for most of the rest of this year. Uh, it's right now at a point where the Oregon Water Resources Department um, is addressing the first phase of that, which is um, cleaning up some of the water rights that the hatchery has. That would be taking place regardless of whether this project was moving forward or not. And because the Water Resources Department received so many uh, comments on this particular water transfer, they're looking for a process or an approval by their equivalent of their city council, the Oregon Water Resources Commission. They make the, um, the policy that the Water Resources Department follows. And the staff at the Water Resources Department is looking for an approval of a process whereby they can respond to public comments electronically. And that's going to be um, uh, in front of the Water Resources Commission this week. They have their regular meeting on um, Thursday and Friday of this week. It is on their agenda um, for Friday morning discussing it and hopefully getting approval of a process by which they can respond to the public comments that they have received about the water rights, the water transfer um, at the hatchery. So once that takes place, once that's approved and those comments, uh, the responses to comments are sent out, um, and if that, that, the, um, that first phase of the transfer is approved, then the Water Resources Department will be evaluating exchange between the city and the hatchery. That's the next step. And that will that will go over the course of the next several months. We, as far as Nestle is concerned, we've been having some discussions with the port over some potential uh, land opportunities for a potential bottling plant. So um, we're still moving forward and evaluating that and having some discussions with the port. We're continuing to monitor the water quality, water quantity over the course of the different seasons. Uh, and so it seems because we're starting to move, continue to move this process forward, it's an appropriate time for us to sit down with representatives of the city, start discussing what the economics are going to be as far as water rates, electrical rates, um, wastewater, any of the utilities that the city would be providing where there would be a, a, a cost associated with it. Um, it's an appropriate time to sit down, to put some, some meat around those bones so both Nestle and the community understands what the expectations This is my first time in front of you since the new council has been seated. Um, and so I want to wish you a happy new year and thank you for letting me come speak to you. Sure. You're welcome. Thanks, Dave. Um, so having heard uh, staff report and questions or comments, uh, it's time now for us to move to a motion or a second. And a second. I'll move we uh, create a city uh, council economic development subcommittee. Okay. Motion by Tom Cramlett. Is there a second? Second. Second by Jeff Helfrich. Council comment, question, or discussion? No? So again, we're the big holding point of all this is ultimately going to be kind of getting the water. You're saying that it's looking like at least a year that we'll be looking at. Uh, going through the process with the uh, water resources. Yes, that, you know, that's their, their process has 30-day you know, 30, 30 public comment periods. Um, so once the water transfer for the, the Oxbow Hatchery water rights has been finalized, there'll be a 30-day comment period associated with that. If there are any comments or appeals, there is an administrative process that, that someone would have to go through for that. Um, I haven't really built that into that, that number, but I, I'm from the number 
numbers that the staff at the Water Resources Department have provided us as far as the timeline to go through the process, we're looking at a good, I mean, I think at, at a minimum of eight months from now, that would be completed, if not closer to the year. And I guess part of the question is then too is, uh, in these types of things, if we cross all of our T's, dot all of our I's, and determine that's what water resources want to do, we should be able to, there shouldn't really be anything to get our way from this thing happening. Or is there something out there where they don't allow these things to? I'm not sure I quite understand the question. If, if, it, if it makes it through, if the water exchange, the application for the water exchange makes it through water resources and all any appeals uh, followed by that, once that's done, then that does set the stage, at least from the water resources side and the water rights side, there's nothing in there to, to prevent that. Okay. <coughs> so we don't know whether, same thing, we're, we're, we are stuck waiting for, there could be a no and there could be a, there could be a yes, we're looking for a yes, but there could be also a no coming out of this thing. Is that, there's, there is that possibility then? I would say there's a possibility of that, yes. And with that possibility, and I'm just from a possibility side, are we, can we, are we still going to be able to move ahead with this project if that, if that doesn't happen? Is there any other options we have here with our, because I assume you've looked at a lot of other options we could do here too. Are there other options for us? We've not been looking at, I mean, there are, there are no other options as far as spring water okay. supplies. Yeah. Um, and that's that, what you're interested in. For, so for, a, for a, a portion of that, that right. bottom plant, yes, right. okay. correct. Okay. So we just got to go through the process here. We're going to go through the process. We're, we're um, you know, in constant discussions or, or contact with the staff from Water Resources so we know where, where the process is along the steps. Um, we're also hearing that the, uh, the governor's office is receiving a fair amount of um, input from people outside of the Cascade Locks to the River area, a large volume of letters and comments uh, opposing this project have been going into the governor's office, not part of the water resources um, process where there's a, a comment associated with an application. It's more just generic comments, probably form letters, electronic emails, going to the governor's office um, asking the governor to intervene and stop the process. Um, we are uh, looking to have, we're planning to have some discussions with the governor's staff over this. Um, we feel that this should be a decision that the, the, the community and the, the, the citizens of Cascade Lock should be making and not the, the, uh, the folks from, from Portland who, who you know, aren't facing uh, economic challenges like you are. So this committee there, this, this is good. Obviously, then this is a good, a good benefit for, for us and for us and for this community to be able to tie together on this economic. It, it's so a, we're, we're all in it, obviously in it together then. Yeah, I, 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 we support, we support having some sort of activity going on where we're all sitting around the table mm -hmm. talking about, uh, about the economics. I don't see any harm in it. Um, since there is this period of time that we're all waiting for the, the water resources department to make a decision on the process. Uh, it's, it's a good idea for everybody so that, again, so community members can have a little more understanding about what the economic uh, economics are around the, the rate structure. Okay. Jeff? I, I don't know if you can count particular numbers, but I talked to port staff and roughly there was 5,000 give or take comments given to the Water Resource Board of opposing this project? Do you, know, do you know specific numbers or not? That's the number I've heard uh, as far as what Water Resources has received um, on the application for the water transfer. So obviously the citizens, our, our citizenry here, the, the cap of people living here in Cascade Locks is not 5,000 people. So there's a lot of outside influences from people other than the people who live here that are affected directly by this project that are trying to influence the outcome of this. And then I guess the follow-up to that is the governor's numbers that I heard were roughly 35 or 38,000, somewhere there, and a very high percentage were out-of-state people sending letters to the governor's office. Once again, people who don't live here 
are trying to influence a direct impact, telling us what we do, what we need to do, what we we know better than you do as a citizen of Cascade Locks, and this project's not for you. Is that a fair statement? Um, the, the numbers that you were quoting are the same numbers that I've heard. I don't know about from where the, uh, if they were out of state or in state, but they were certainly, you know, for 35 to 38,000 comments are coming into the governor's office. They're clearly not coming from Cascade Lot. So, yeah. um, yes, th those, those numbers, I, I've heard the same numbers being quoted and from representatives from the governor's office. And you've had projects like this before in other city cities, and whether you've had a stiff of opposition or not from outside sources, what have citizens done to affect that and let their voices be heard? Um, that's an excellent question. I think um, I think one of the one of the things is is specifically to make your voices heard. Um, granted, there's no way that a community of 1,200 people can compete with 35,000 comments coming from outside of an area. But uh, I think having having comments that specifically identify that somebody I am from Cascade Locks or I am from the Cascade Locks area or even the Hood River County area and we're facing, you know, describe the economic challenges that are being faced, describe the personal challenges that are being faced because of lack of jobs or lack of ability to get the jobs. Um, that's the, that's the, the best you can do, I mean, you, is, is to stand up and make, make your voices heard. Um, there is, as I said, there's a water commission meeting at the end of this week where they're going to be discussing the process. We are anticipating representatives from the opposition to be standing up during the public comment period, just like a public comment period in one of your city council meetings. Uh, the public has an opportunity to address the Water Resources Commission. Uh, we anticipate that there will be representatives from either Food, Food and Water Watch or some other groups that may oppose this project from outside of the area speaking about why it shouldn't go through. It's a great opportunity to have citizenry representatives from the politicians, from the court, to attend that meeting to speak your mind in support of this and to speak what you feel about having outside influences try to direct uh, direct your direct your economic growth or economic opportunities. I'll, I'm, I'm, one thing I did mention is I'm going to be in my office uh, next to the post office uh, tomorrow afternoon, one to one to four, and then on Wednesday from nine to five, I can provide information if people are interested in going down to that meeting. I can provide a copy of the agenda and what time the uh, agenda items will be in front of the water commission meeting. Uh, meeting. Thanks, Randy. Hey, uh, Dave, it, it, I know you guys have probably walked the whole uh, aquifer area here, but on the west end of town, there's a water source. Is that surface water or is that there is a spring small water? spring there is a small spring on the west end of town it was a little bit close to some development that it potentially posed uh, that we felt it had it was a potential risk for some contamination from some of the development residential development in the area that we didn't feel comfortable building a plant relying on a, a, a spring that was so close to some development plus it's a considerably smaller than the, uh, the spring over at the Oxbow factory. Okay. I, I, in the back of my mind, I remembered another water source that the city had a right on, and, or at least a few years back. And kind of as, also as a follow-up, maybe for Paul, it's been, will this come to any sort of land use hearing for that we're, we're going to have to sit in a quasi-judicial manner at some point? Uh, at this point, I do not know. Because I could see ourselves, you know, we're neck ne <laughs> deep, deep in water. We could also be... Nick deep in conflicts of interest at some point. But. I, I can check that and get back to you. Jill? Uh, re <clears throat> regarding the, the opposition that's been talked about, do you, do you have a sense of what most of the opposition is? It could, people don't like plastic? Or is it that simple or is there other issues? My, uh, well, the organization that's primarily this is an organ a national organization called Food and Water Watch, and they are fundamentally opposed to bottled water. And they essentially they load a shotgun and shoot everything they can right. as far as issues uh, that that they oppose. Okay. Um, so I can't particularly speak to what what their their opposition is because I, I don't I don't necessarily agree with it. I don't support support what their opposition is. Okay. Um, I believe that they've gotten that number that volume of comments or uh, um, emails to the governor's office through uh, a website or a web posting that they have where they just made it very easy for 
somebody to go on and click and say and put their name and say I oppose this and it shoots an email off to the governor's <coughs> office. That's probably the only way they could get uh, get that number of, of, of comments to the governor's office. So they've made it easy. They've they've uh, focused on uh, a, an area, a part of the state where they have uh, they can find a lot of support for their types of cause or the, the way they portray their cause. Sure. And so that's what okay. they're getting that. <coughs> this review with with the water rights commission or whatever whatever they are. Uh, is that like a ecological impact review to where their scope is limited to water? Implications not whether it ends up in plastic or metal or? Correct. It's, okay. it's very specific. They, they have a very specific okay. set of criteria what they're looking at as far as whether or not they will approve, uh, approve a water rights transfer or an exchange okay. application. Okay. And to your point, there may be a lot of comments coming in that are just more that expressing somebody's fundamental views right. about uh, water that have nothing to do with the okay. actual right. Understood. mechanics of the exchange. All right. And then my last thing is, uh, assuming the process goes through and the water issue is resolved, then it sounds like the last steps would be just some business decisions between the port and property and the city and infrastructure, is that oversimplifying it or? It, it, it might be oversimplifying it a little bit as far as um, uh, there, there may be some things that need to be finalized between the port and the city as far as land or utilities, et cetera. Um, that may be, the, those may be the final things that the port and the city need to do. Then there's a final decision or, or step at, from our end as far as timing is, you know, once all of that's taken care of, it doesn't mean the next day we'll be putting a shovel in the ground and starting to, to, to build uh, build the factory. There are a lot of other factors um, from our end that we have to review um, as far as the, the, the timing and the growth in the business, as far as when when we expect to have the need to build to be actually modeling products at that plant. Okay, so it's not imminent. It, I wouldn't say it's imminent. Okay. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, Dave. The um, you were talking earlier when you first started the uh, port, and you've been you know talking to the port. Are you talking to the port um, for a different location, or uh, you know some a different um, size of plant, or maybe a shorter distance from the hatchery to the plant? I mean, is there a, a are you moving in a different location, or just uh, just talking? We're just talking right now. We're you know we're looking at what the other what the options are. Mm -hmm. When we started this project, the only potential option for land that we were looking at that would work for the project was the industrial land of the gravel pit. Mm -hmm. um, since that time, we've had some discussions with the port and some things have, have opened up as far as some potential opportunities. And so we wanted to explore what those, what those options are. Um, so uh, I'll be sitting down. I've been having some discussions on the phone with Chuck Daughtry. We can sit down and talk with him. There are engineers who can kind of taking what the layout of one of our bottom plants of this size would look like and trying to fit it on different uh, different parcels out there to see which ones it would work. Okay. So uh, we talk about the opposition to this project and some of it, you know, it's, it's certainly coming from outside um, our community and maybe even outside of our region. Uh, and I've, I've actually taken the opportunity to go to some meetings of these opposition groups and hear what they have to say. And sometimes they like to play a little movie that shows you, you know, why they're opposed to, to project, projects like these. And, and I think that when you say are they against plastic, I think you probably put your finger on, on one, of the, one of the main sticking points that they're against, that, that these people oppose. And, and there's certainly some reasons to be against plastic um, because it, it's, I mean, you've, you've seen big uh, government entities like um, the uh, city of Portland has taken to banning plastic bags in, their, in, in stores within the city limits because it creates so much trash. And certainly there's, you know, if you look at some of the things that are happening in the Pacific Ocean, we've got a giant floating plastic reef spinning around in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And, and there's some reasons to be concerned about um, the amount of plastic that we're producing. And 
the difficulty for me is then laying at the, at the feet of Nestle and saying, it's your fault because we've got the, you know, this hundreds of acre size floating reef in the Pacific Ocean and, and little tiny bits of plastic are mixing with the sand and washing up and we're having plastic beaches in some places in the world. Um, when you look at, at um, the amount of plastic that Nestle, for instance, is producing, it's, it's not really contributing in a, in a large way to, to those kinds of problems. Um, if, even if you were to take the bottled water industry as a whole, and are they contributing to this? Well, I mean, when you think about how many, you know, Gatorades and fruit juices and soda pop bottles that are out there, it, it dwarfs the amount of bottled water that's out there. So there's, you know, yeah, there's, there's opposition to plastic, and this is, maybe it's the shotgun approach, but it's, it's hard to say that a four-line facility in tiny Cascade Locks is contributing to the plastic beaches in Mexico or Australia or wherever they are. So, um, so I think there's, there's that. And then there's also the concern about is water a commodity or is water a public resource? And there's been some philosophical discussions about that. I think certainly Nestle has the position that it's a, it's a commodity. It can be just like anything else. It can be, it can be bottled and sold. And there's a market for it. And, and you know, my, the way I look at it is if you, if you don't like all that plastic or if you think bottled water is, should not be a, um, you know, a, a commodity, then don't buy it, right? Uh, rather than trying to oppose uh, economic development in a, in a small rural community that needs it. <coughs> so, uh, and, and those, those are kind of the two main things I've heard as far as opposition. But they're certainly organized. Um, I, I was at work the other day and a colleague of mine had been down to Powell City of Books and you know, there's someone passing out flyers and a petition signing, you know, in downtown Portland to try to stop this project at Cascade Locks. That's not really at the level where we even call it a project yet. It's just a, it's an opportunity. So there's certainly, there's certainly organized opposition. Um, I certainly believe that the community is interested in pursuing this and, and as well as other economic development opportunities. Um, we talk about the meeting this coming Friday. Um, and, and making our voices heard. It, it, the really difficult thing for me to say is, you know, how, how would a citizen from Cascade Locks go to the, the Water Resources Board and then say, I, I'm in favor of this or I'm against it. It's not really a project at this point, which is why I think it's important that we do support this motion because we'll be able to create a subcommittee uh, on economic development. And, and the council will be working on that and be working Primarily at the beginning with, uh, with Nestle to, to turn this, this idea, this opportunity into something that we could call a project and, and to give it the kind of details that people could oppose or support. Um, until we get there, I just don't see, um, I don't see how you can really hear from our community. I mean, they can, people can be against plastic or against the commoditization of, of water, but um, in, in general, but when we talk about the specifics of what the, the Water Resources Board are going to be going to be looking at, we'd like to have some some specific things that we can that we can support if this is a, a viable economic development opportunity for our community. And so, for that reason, I think it is important that we establish this subcommittee. Um, I wanted to talk. Paul mentioned it briefly, but I did want to talk a little bit with the council about um, how I would foresee this working if we create the subcommittee tonight. Then any council members that are interested in being appointed to that, and I know some of you have already talked to me about wanting to be on that committee. Um, you could certainly talk to me, and then at our next council meeting, uh, I would make the appointment um, subject to your approval. So that, that's how that process would go. I think it, it would get us toward our immediate goal of having conversations with Nestle and, and the port and, um, and hashing out um, some, some more details so we can get a better idea of what this, what this project might look like if it gets to that stage. But it's also something I think we, we should bear in mind that the members of this subcommittee would also be uh, expected to work with the port on our joint task force on economic development on this and then as well as many other opportunities that we have come into our community. So um, 
as, as part of this discussion, I want I just want to make sure that part's out on the table. That if we create this, that's how I intend to proceed based on uh, the charter as well as um, you know interest level in our in our council. Bill, uh, a couple other things. One, has the council adopted any kind of resolution in support of Nestle's that where they say they're meeting with the mayor that they can take this as evidence of community support? Is that already on the books or anything or? Well, I, I mean, I don't recall any. I would turn to Kathy and, as, a, as a recorder. Well, I, I don't know what the due process is, but I know in other actions in the past, the council has adopted a resolution in support of a project to show evidence of, you know, uh, that kind of support. So that's one. I mean, I think that's something that the that the subcommittee could okay. recommend to right. the council. I just, I was trying to express okay. is I don't feel like we're really at a stage where we can say this is the project. I mean, there's there's questions about, about what it might be, about how it's going to work, but I haven't heard those answers, and I think this is a step towards getting us to those answers. I mean, other than the idea that there would be a, a water exchange and that they would be building right. the plans. Okay, whatever. And the city would be selling. But I think this is a step to get to, to answer those questions. Mr. Zach, may yeah. I comment on that? Uh, sure. I, I completely agree with you, and I understand where you're, where you're coming from. It's difficult to want to commit to the support of the project without having an understanding of what some more relevant details are. But I think you also made a very um, salient point there is that uh, while you don't, while you may not be at a point where you're comfortable committing to the support of the project, um, I do, do get the sense that you want to at least have the opportunity to be able to consider the project or consider economic development opportunities that are coming in front of you. And here is a group of opposition who is already opposing a project that doesn't have any of the details around it yet. Those the details as you were describing. We you know, discussed what we envision the, the size of the facility and the number of employees, etc. Um, and they're trying to even stop the project from even coming in front of you to be able to have the opportunity to consider it. And so perhaps uh, uh, an alternate way of, of expressing is even to have somebody come down to water resources. And I know it's difficult for citizenry to get all the way down to Salem on a Friday afternoon, also working and coming back in traffic. It's, you know, people have other lives and jobs that they're dealing with right now. Um, but to get some sort of statement down, both to the water resources and to the governor's office, that you know, perhaps you'd like to have, have at least have the opportunity to consider an economic development opportunity that's being put in front of you before having all of these other folks from outside of the area tell you you shouldn't do it. Is, is an alternate approach. And, and yeah, I think you're right. That is what I'm trying to express, is this is an opportunity that we would, that we as a community would like to explore. We'd like to have the ability to explore that. Um, but I think we do have to take some, some steps to, you know, to formalizing that so that we, that we will have the opportunity to explore it. And I think this, you know, the motion is to, <coughs> is to create this subcommittee, and I think that's what the subcommittee would do. Randy. A question for Dave, since you're here, I'll pick on you a little bit, but you've seen other towns. I know you've, you've worked with some other communities, but is, is there a story behind our water resource that's different than other communities? Um, What's your opinion of, on that? I think I've told a number of you that you, you while you may think that some of the, the stuff that you see going on here is, is, is unusual and that we haven't seen this anywhere else, you're very, you're very typical. These sorts of things happen in in the other communities that, that we're in. Um, the, the the sort of the opposition coming in and from outside, trying to initially try to get <coughs> support for their their views internally, and if they don't get that, then they they are also working on on the periphery to try to get uh, the high volumes of emails and letters going into the, the state level policy. I, I was more, uh, I understand what you're saying, and, it, and I, I agree that we're probably typical, but I'm talking about the water resource, uh, um, the, the aquifer, yeah. the, the amount of rain. The, talk, talking about from that side of it is, are we different than 
a lot of communities. You are in that you get more water here than I've ever seen in any other community. You get something like 70 or 80 inches of rain a year. I've never seen that uh, in any, any other community. Um, it is the this process is a little bit more complex because the spring is is located at a state fish hatchery. So there there is that added complexity. Mm -hmm. um, but every location is different. Every every location has something associated with it that's com more complex than one other other location. But to your point on the water resource, uh, you know, you're you're very from from that standpoint, you're very fortunate to have the type of recharge uh, and the type of precipitation that, that you get every year. Part of part of the things Food and Water Watch brings up is that when they when a bottling plant goes in, three counties over, a well goes dry. And uh, and I guess I've always argued that um, that could happen, and we have so much water that maybe we owe it to the rest of the country to have it here to keep some well from going dry somewhere else. Um, because we've, we've got an overabundance. And I guess that's the question that at some point I'd like to have answered is, will it make any difference to pull out that kind of water, um, you know, we're being told no that we have pumping capacity, you know, at the wellhead that that's substantial. Um, I guess it's kind of a comment, maybe a question in there too. But yeah, I, I think I, I can I can answer the question that's in there. Um, first of all, the the your comment about in, in other locations that where they say where Nestle's come in and. Well, I'm not mentioning Nestle in particular, but but, but to, to that point, I, I will speak specifically to us. We in those locations, uh, often in those locations, we're actually pumping water from a well, and we commit to we we will have a uh, an agreement in place that if somebody feels that their well, their residential well, has been impacted by our our operations, we will have we will investigate. We'll have a third party, an independent third party geologist, investigate it. And if it is our responsibility, if, if they can associate what's happened to somebody's well with our operations, then we will take steps to correct it. And we've had cases where people have filed uh, claims against us that, that we have impacted their wells. And we've gone through the steps, and independent hydrogeologists have, have validated that, no, it's not, it's not the bottling plant. It's just that your well was not constructed properly or there's been a, a, a regional drought and the water table all around is, is dropping and it would have been like this whether the bottling plant was there or not. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are willing in those situations to, to put the steps in place to investigate and correct if we're responsible. In this case, there'd be no, um, no the, the spring water is gonna be coming naturally out of the spring, so there'll be no pumping at the spring. The water that will be replaced up to the hatchery from your groundwater wells and any water that will be going over the bottling plant for the purified water will be coming from within your existing and allowed water rights. So there would be no additional pumping beyond what your water rights entitle you to. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, uh, I guess more two comments. When you had the meeting at the port and you had uh, the person from Oregon State give your presentation about that, one of the talks was, you know, truckload or trucks per hour and nobody complained when the logging trucks were going on when Cascade Locks was a, a strong logging community and now there's maybe some complaints about lot or water trucks but the economic development is, it was a very good presentation. So the people that have not seen that presentation, you know, go to the website, Oregon State website, I can't remember the gentleman's it's name, the professor. It's on our website. We have his presentation posted yeah. on our project website. Have people go to that. But the other part is, is in uh, talking with Paul numerous times and talking about economic growth development and how Oregon kind of sometimes tempers and kills jobs for whatever reason it will drag out longer. The last project we had here being with our uh, Confederate tribes of Warm Springs and the casino and resort that was here, that drug out for a long time and then eventually died uh, for this dragging out. I think we, and that's more of a suggestion to Lance and to the rest of the council, has become very proactive, very aggressive in pursuing this and letting our intentions be known that if this is good for our community, get our voices out there ahead of time and ahead of that because as you said, the opposition to this is very organized, and um, they can always do the shotgun approach, which gets everybody in a tizzy about this, and if the governor is wavering and committing a special counsel at some point to review this, and as long as this keeps going, it's there. And talking with Paul, he's given numerous examples where 
people try to come into Oregon and set up jobs and yet they'll go across the river and do it. I would hate to see uh, people try to derail this project and get a very good economic development for our community be derailed by people outside of this and having that voice. I would ask that this subcommittee have a very strong voice and put, put, uh, put it out there that if this is what the will of the community is for this project, that we push this and get this rapidly and moving forward as fast as we can with safeguards in place that we're protected, but we have to get that voice out there that if, if the citizens want this, we need to do that. And that puts the pressure on our elected body in Salem, hey, this is what's good for us, so let us make our own decisions. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and I agree with that. I, don't, I also want to point out, though, a lot of our discussion tonight has to do with the Nestle project, and, and it is an opportunity. I think I, I certainly want to caution um, uh, the council and the community against putting all our eggs in the Nestle basket. Uh, I think there's a lot of different economic opportunities. We've already heard from our tourism committee about the website and the word, words they're trying to get out about the tourist opportunities. And that's, that's one piece of the pie. If you look at our multifaceted economic development approach that Paul's drawn up there, that, that scales pie, um, you can see that we've... Kind of looks like an umbrella. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, jobs is one part of it, right? But we've, we've got a, a you know, we're going to, I think we're going to hear from George a little bit later about, um, uh, you know, education opportunities here in Cascade Locks. And, and there's a lot of, we, we have to look at this as a multifaceted approach. I certainly hope we do. This is one opportunity. I think it is important to be aggressive and to, to pursue it to the extent that we can, as you say, with safeguards in place. But I don't want us to think that we're, you know, we're jumping on, on one wagon here. We're, I, I would like this subcommittee to have a multifaceted approach. So there's a lot of different projects that, um, uh, that we can pursue. Because this may not happen. They, as, as Tom brought up initially, um, we may, you know, the Water Resources Board may say no. I don't want us to have everything resting on this project. I think we have, it's very important for the future of this community that we have a multifaceted approach. And I think that's why creating this, um, this subcommittee is a good step. Uh, Don, I just, uh, I'll make my comment. What you, you, yeah, if you wanted to add it to that, that'd be great. Okay. Okay, other comments or questions, discussion from the council? Okay, hearing none, we'll proceed to a vote. The motion was to create the Council Subcommittee on Economic Development. Uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Mayor Kaufman. Okay. Um, and that will do it for our action items this evening. Um, Next item on our agenda is the appearance of interested citizens sharing a variety of perspectives on issues facing our community. We have two people signed up to talk during that time, and uh, we'll start with Don. Yeah, you guys mentioned that too. Yeah. What's your topic? It'll be general things. Could you be more specific? It'll be uh, what I'm referring to tonight. start on what I was going to start on. I hope the rest of the council doesn't follow the mayor's lead on this. It sounds like he's trying to kill it or we can get to talk about it. I've attended every meeting that Nestle had. I would say if there's 60 people at a meeting, there's five from the city of Cascade Locks. And if we don't get behind this, we're not going to have anything in this town. Everybody from out of town is here. Nobody from the town comes. Maybe five or six people. And I watched some of the presentations that the other people put on. The first one I attended was a film about Africa. 40 minutes about Africa. That was the whole presentation they put on. You better come and watch some of these things to see what's happening. I hope you don't get it shot down before it gets off the ground. What I wanted to talk about First, during the recall process, there was a process, a program put on at the Port Pavilion. And I think the heading was the truth about the finances of the city of Cascade Locks. 
I would like to suggest that the council has that group come on and give this presentation to the council. Uh, some of the people on the council were involved, but this, they already worked out how it will be solved. And I think it'd be a very interesting program to watch. We have films available, if you want us to put on film, Duke's film, because it's supposedly the whole process was solved so that everything's taken care of. And that's what the recall was based on, so it must be true. So I suggest you either have this group put it on, show it to the city, show it to the council, maybe it'll solve all our problems, because it's supposed to be true. My second item is the FEMA grant. I don't see anything happening. But everything I can find out, our town is gonna to be stuck with anywhere from 70 to $90,000 that we are gonna to have to pay, the citizens. Do you know why we're gonna to have to pay it? Because we let a city employee go out and sign a FEMA contract without even telling the county, without telling 911, without telling the sheriff's department, without telling the city council, we're still paying legal fees trying to fight this. It's going to cost us seventy to ninety thousand dollars. What are we doing about it? Anything? I think it's about time we start doing something. I remember I was six or oh, eight months ago. I was going to get a report. I think the mayor was going to arrange for me to get a report. There still is not one single report on a, almost a half a million dollar project. Not one report. And we just ignore it. It's all right. We can allow that. I suggest you go up and talk to Hood River County. We're in a mess. And I have to tell the water company I'm behind a project. At least go see if it get off the ground. Excellent, John. Cody, you wanted to talk about what you've observed tonight? Yeah. First of all, oh, man. I brought up some good points just now, too, about having it all worked out. I got all the information on that thing. I've seen the video on that meeting down at the pavilion. Yeah, you had it all worked out. You're blaming the council for uh, taking all the cuts, cutting them from the general fund. Blame them all for that. But your first act was you went and you took from the general fund, made a cut to it to pay for Devon Wells, 2500 a month. So you recall the council for exactly what you turned around and did as your first act. Second, the FEMA grant Don just brought up. We're not including, nobody's talking about the theft of the tower that happened by the city employees up there. Two city officials here, and on the public record, did in fact take a tower not belonging to the city and use it as that tower. That's going to cost us another 25 to 30 grand to fix. That's the last estimate that I've heard of, just for that. Um, and tonight, my issue is I sat here and watched you. I brought up issues that, that, that have legal standing under the law. I heard questions from a council member that. Well, have you seen any other cities that are doing this yet? Well, it doesn't matter. If it's a law, we've got to worry about our city being in compliance with the law. We don't really care about other cities. Now, I did answer you that, yes, I am looking into other cities, but that's not the point. What are we doing? So, I've heard things that using tourism portion of the funds to paint the fire hall. Can you make that a uh, tourism use there, Gil? I don't know. The, the comments are but, just for the general council. Well, I, think the I don't question. think the Constitution has that restriction. I'm um, being addressed on my council. What At the public know? meeting, you talk to the general council. Well, I don't think the Constitution has that plan. Or you show me the Constitution says that. Good. Does that have the right to free speech and to redress my government? Okay, hey, George, you want to talk about the boundary change? Thank you, Cody. You're welcome.
I'd like to address the council tonight. Um, again, uh, some of you already heard part of what I'm going to say because this was part of the uh, town hall meeting that we had down at the pavilion to discuss the boundary change with any of the community members that came. Uh, we had about 34 to 36 people <coughs> come to that meeting. Um, I thought that was a, a very good turnout considering the time that's been involved um, going with this. I guess the first thing that I want to tell everybody is that, you know, I, I, I've always been passionate about Cascade Lock. You know, and I honestly believe that if we lose our school, that, that we will be a ghost town. Okay? Um, you know, we don't have Nestle water yet, just like we didn't have a casino yet. Um, we do have a school, but slowly and methodically we've been losing our school, which you're all aware of. Okay? It, it's not about the teachers that teach at the school. They do a great job of educating. They always have in Cascade Lock. Cascade Lock has been a small rural school that's, that always outperformed the rest of the district, okay? So in that aspect, the thing that, that's so devastating is, is um, I had a, an email that, that came to Paul Cook, and it was from uh, Bruce Sorty, and he's the community economics of Eastern Oregon. Anyway, and, and he wrote, and I'm only gonna read part of this, Cascade Locks' persistence efforts to reinstate their local high school and retain their elementary and middle school are critical to the survival of a community and the vitality of the, eco of the economy. Local schools are one, if not the most important keystone sector in the community. If a school closed, the possibilities are high that the community will also close. Okay? I think about the research and the presentation that I did for a rural <coughs> symposium in Cloud Rock on endangered communities, and the 25% of rural towns that are no longer counted in the census over the last century. Anyway. That's all I'm going to read from that. But Bruce talked to me after that meeting, and he told me that I need to get on the bandwagon. And he said, I need to get people fired up. I need to get them involved so that they realize the reality of what is happening. And he says the old saying that history repeats itself. Well, we know they already took our high school. They said they weren't going to take our junior high kids. They did. And now this year they're going to take our six graders. Okay, so I have tried repeatedly to work with Hood River County School District. I work with them. I tried to do everything they wanted. I asked them to follow by their own policy. They broke their own policy. They even broke state law. It doesn't matter. They are a board. They can vote and do whatever they want, and nobody's going to say a thing to them. Even if they did say something to them, they still do not have to do anything, okay? So I don't know how to impress on you how important it is that we maintain our school. And I, and I believe that if, if we let our school go away, that our community will go away because people won't want to move here. It's just, it's a, it's,
part of economics. It's what happens. Our community will cease to exist because people will start moving closer to the schools because they won't want to live here because we don't have a school. So I'm here to ask the council to come, uh, to come and help me, help the city, to try to maintain the economic stability that we need to maintain in our city. It's a two-fold situation, okay? And the last thing that we can do is we can do a boundary change, okay? On Wednesday at 6.30 at the district building in Hood River, at the school district building, at the district office, I should say, there's gonna be a meeting at 6.30 where we're gonna present to the school board the opportunity for them to work with us to try to do a merger, to allow the merger of Cascade Locks into the Corbett School District, okay? I have an idea of what's gonna transpire, but I don't know. But again, we are trying to work with the school district, trying to save our community, okay? So the first thing I would like to ask is any person who interested, pro or con, please show up, be there, state your views, pro or con, hopefully you'd be supportive. Let's show up at that meeting, just to show the school district there's still people in Cascade Lock who care about what happens to our community, okay? Um, if, if the merger attempt if Hood River County School District decides they do not want to do a merger, then it will fall back and Hood River County will say that, well, we're the best model for you. You're, we're better than Corbett. The only problem is, is right now, from what I see and what has happened in the past, I can't see a future with Hood River. Last year, they shut down the Pine Grove Elementary School that had 143 students. They shut it down because it was economically unfeasible to keep that elementary school open. They still have the school. They have computer outlets and they have other things there for, and they hold different classes, but there's no longer an elementary school there. Those children were all bused to probably either Westside or Hood River or wherever, but they were bused and those elementary kids no longer go to Pine Grove, okay? So, when they take our sixth graders away next year, we'll be down to around 50 kids. The reality is, if you look at it, do you honestly believe that they would keep our school open with only 50 kids when it's only gonna cost them $6,000 to bus those 60 kids to Hood River? Because the state of Oregon pays 70% of all busing fees. So, that's a reality that we have to look at. So the boundary change, the merger is what we're gonna ask them for. If they don't wanna do the merger, then we will pursue and continue to pursue and do the boundary change, okay? The boundary change is something that you, we have to go out and get petitions from registered voters from Hood River County and from the Corbett School District and we have to get a certain number, we have to get 500 from Hood River and I think 130 from Corbett to sign those. And then it goes to the uh, county commissioner's board. They're the board that decides and rules over boundary changes as of the 1st of January. So the next thing is, is if you have friends that are part of the county commissioner's